Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. It's uh, it's good to be here tonight. Um, tonight's topic, we heard... Uh, We heard last week, Ron just gave a great presentation on step four, if anybody was here. Uh, He was phenomenal. We're going to be covering steps five, six, and seven, and we we named this particular portion uh, Divorcing from Attachments, and there's kind of a reason for that. When I, uh, you know, when I first came into Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I understood that it was a 12-step program. Uh... I got very, very involved in the fellowship, the fellowship, going to meetings, hanging out, you know, getting a sponsor, talking with them, uh, finding service commitments. I was even going back and volunteering at the treatment center that I was at uh, just to give service. And I got very, very involved with uh, with the fellowship. But it was only a uh, it was only a number of years later when I got exposed to some uh, recovery recordings that I understood that I was shortchanging myself on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I had made a stab, you know, kind of a, kind of a, uh, an attempt to do the fourth and the fifth. Um, when I had about seven or eight months, my sponsor suggested it was about time for me to do, uh, to do a fourth step. And you know, I didn't have really any experience with this before. I was going to a lot of step meetings, but step meetings don't guarantee that you can learn uh, learn how to actually take the steps. Uh, so I was going to a lot of step meetings, and I, I, you know, I was going, I was hearing people share about their experience with the fourth and the fifth step, but I still didn't really understand it. I I I just didn't <clears throat> didn't really follow um, how. The mechanics of the step worked. Uh, I had heard things in meetings like, well, you tell your, you know, you write down your story. And I had heard things like, you just got to tell them everything. And, you know, I, I heard a lot of things like this, but as far as actually doing uh, the fourth step, I missed the big book. I mean, the big book was just not a, a prominent fixture in the meetings that I was going to. So when it came time for me to do a four step, what what am I going to do? I went to the step book. There's a whole chapter on the four step in the step book. And I you know, I read that a couple of times and I was kind of confused. It talked about the seven deadly sins and I thought I had 14 of them, you know, and and, and there was just uh uh they they talked a lot about uh different things that it sounded religious or it sounded psychological. I didn't really understand it. But I knew my sponsor expected a four step out of me, so I sat down and I started writing. And uh this is about seven months. What what it looked like when I got done was it looked like part life story, part list of all the dirty rotten things I had done that I had never told anybody. And I even had a, had some stuff in there uh, as far as patterns that I saw in my behavior. You know, I would see a pattern like uh, I would judge people for the exact same characteristic I had and wasn't happy with having. You know, and I I saw patterns like this. Well, when you do it, when you do a four step that way, you don't learn anything about yourself because you're writing down the things that you already know. When you look in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about the fourth step as as uh, basically being you're going to discover some deep truths about yourself. Uh, you're going to uncover the uh, exact nature of your wrongs. You're going to find out why you keep shooting yourself in the foot in this game called life. And if all I'm doing is writing down the stuff that I already know, I'm not really achieving what the exercise, the spiritual exercise of the fourth step is asking me to to do. So I get exposed to a a set of recovery tapes uh, somewhere. It was in somewhere in early 1991. And it was a it was a big book workshop. And it caught me by surprise in a number of ways. Uh, 
One of them was when I when I started listening to this, it, it basically painted the picture that I didn't know what an AA program was, let alone wasn't working one. And this wasn't really the type of news I wanted to hear. I was going to 13 meetings a week. I mean, I'd made my life AA. And what I didn't understand is it was all fellowship based. There was no program. And when I learned this, the first thing that happened was I got pissed. You know, uh, who are these people? You know, this isn't how we do it in New Jersey. You know, there was a there was a reaction because nobody wants to feel small. Nobody wants to think that, you know, they're falling short, especially when you're going to as many meetings and participating like crazy as I was, you know, everybody was patting me on the head. Chris, you're doing great. You know, I see you everywhere. You know, you're doing great. But I really wasn't doing great. Um, when, when I first uh, when I first talked, uh, the, um, it was about six weeks ago here. I talked about aspects of the illness alcoholism. I talked about how alcoholism presents. And I talked about the emotional, the, the psychological, uh, the, the physical, all the, all the ways that al alcoholism presents. Now, going to a lot of meetings, which is what I was doing, wasn't treating any of that stuff. It was creating an atmosphere of sobriety. Uh, you know, I was able to stay away uh, from the liquor store or the bar. But, but a lot of the problems that I was having in my life, a lot of the emotional, a lot of the, the, the psychic trauma, the bondage of self that they talk about in the book Alcoholism, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, was all over me. I mean, I was not happy. I couldn't deal. My relationships were still messed up. I suffered from depression, anxiety, guilt, remorse, shame, uh, resentment. I mean, I was, a, I was a walking emotion. And I was going to a million meetings. The thing that really stuck in my mind when I went through these tapes was there's an answer to that. There's a solution to that. You know, we, we work out our issues on the spiritual plane. And looking in, looking in hindsight, that's a great way to finally understand something when you finally understand it. And most of the time, that's after we've experienced it and after we've screwed up a bunch of times. After, being, after, after going through the steps uh, 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 quite a few times, what I realize is, is that the steps treat... The untreated alcoholism. The steps treat the emotional and psychological uh, problems that we all suffer from. It talks in the book where we're restless, irritable, discontented. You know, there's there's a million emotional issues we have. We're filled with fear. We're filled we're filled with resentment. Uh, there's there's times in our lives that we're, we suffer from pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, and we just can't deal. And a lot of, and, and most of the time, these are states that happen when we're sober. And it takes a lot of us out. A lot of us can't get past these, uh, these, this, we can't get past this emotional roller coaster without taking a uh, drink. So the genius in the steps is that it's a spiritual program. It's, it's designed to awaken our spirits. Now to now to talk a little bit about uh, about step five, I have to talk a little bit about step four. Uh, Ron did a great job last week on step four. I'm just going to briefly uh, explain what step four is. Step four is a four column resentment inventory. It's uh, it's a it's a two column fear inventory where you have to answer two questions. And the, there's prayers in the resentment inventory and there's prayers in the fear inventory that you have to do while you're doing the inventory. Then there's the sex harms list, which has nine questions, and then you're to develop a sex ideal, a relationship ideal. You are, you are seeing all the things that are wrong with your relationships. You're actually to put down the attributes of what you think would be a good relationship ideal. How do you want to show up at the party next time that you have one? You know, uh, how do you want your intimate relationships to be? And they don't necessarily have to be sexual intimate, intimate relationships. They can be relationships with the, the family and friends. So you write out a, uh, um, an ideal for future relationships, and then you need to start a prayer 
uh, a prayer regime to ask God to, to help mold and direct you into this new uh, ideal for future relationships. So the difference between doing that and doing a life story is like the difference between night and day. Because what happens is you're able to uncover the exact nature of your problems in life. What is going on? I'm always angry. I always have anxiety or fear. I never feel comfortable with myself or my environment. Why is that? And the four-step answers that question, why is that? So by doing the fourth step, what you're doing is you're painting a picture of where you don't want to be anymore, the things that you don't want to do anymore, because they're not working. If they were working, our, you know, our lives would be a lot better than they are you know, when we walk into AA. You know, we're not running all, on all burners when we come wandering into AA, and very few of us come in because there's nothing on TV that night. You know, we're, you know, we usually have our ass on fire, you know, uh, a summons is in the pocket, you know, a loved ones ready to just disown us, you know, the whole, the whole thing. So I don't know about anybody else, but I want a good quality to my life. I want a quality of my life across the board. I want to be able to get along when I want to be able to get along. I want to be able to deal when I want to deal. I want to have that skill set to be successful in my life, not necessarily with money, but with everything else, with a general quality of life. And I recognize in the fourth step where I'm making my mistakes. Another part of the spiritual awakening is to recognize that your problems are of your own making. Okay, there's a spiritual axiom. Whenever I'm, uh, I'm upset, you know, there's something wrong with me. There's all these places in our literature that, that swings the light right back on us. We cannot be victims. Victims never get better. Okay, We have to take responsibility for the things that are going on in our life. Our problems do not come at us. They come from us. And this is one of the things that you learn in the fourth step. That may not sound like good news. Like, uh, you know, I'm co-creating all of my own disorder at best and causing it all at worst. That may not seem like a good thing, but it's an actually it's a statement of hope. Because if it was all those bastards out there, your chances of changing all them are pretty slim. Your chances of changing something in yourself is pretty good with the 12 step program. Now, this is my second run through the steps and I'm doing it the way these uh, these these big book recovery people are directing me to. And I show up. I show up at my sponsor's house. Now, my sponsor, you know, didn't really at this point in time have a have a working knowledge of the big book. There was few and far between in my area uh, that did back then. Uh, uh, if you hadn't been exposed to recovery through uh, recovery tapes or somebody that moved here from Akron or Texas or, or something, you, you were just out of luck. Uh, so I showed up. I showed up at my sponsor's house, and, and he goes, "What are all those columns? Where's your story?" And I'm like, "Just you know, humor me and let me read this stuff." And I, you know, I read uh, the resentments out. I read. I read in my fears. I admitted. I admitted to God, myself, and another person the exact nature of my wrongs. And that's such an important thing. We are we're kings and queens of drama. You know, if you set somebody loose to just start writing, you know, forget about it. There needs to be some direction. Uh, and with and with these uh, with these specific inventories, uh, there there was uh, there was some direction. Now, in the process of this fifth step, what the the self image that I had was one of low low esteem. Uh, uh, but basically, here, here's, what, uh, here's what I see looking back. I had done a lot of really bad things drinking. You pour a quart or more vodka or bourbon down your throat every day at 4 o'clock and then go out in the world, you're going to cause some problems. I don't care if you're an alcoholic or not. You know what I mean? You just, you just 
<laughs> you're stumbling all over the place, just causing all kinds of trouble. And, you know, there were people who cared about me. I got into some serious relationships. So, you know, I got married. You know, I started to have a family. I had jobs. I had friends. And, you know, one by one, you end up letting those people down. Now, now alcoholism is so strong. Alcoholism is an aggressive illness. Uh, alcohol is like the last thing to go. I mean, you know, to, to pay for drinking, you'll throw your family in the hat. You'll throw your job in the hat. You'll throw your driver's license in the hat. I mean, that's not a conscious decision you're making, but that's what you're doing. You know, when you continue to drink and you continue to lose everything and everybody, if that is your experience you're not going to really feel good about yourself inside. You know, and I, and I didn't. I was always thinking that, you know, somebody was going to find me out, you know, or if they really knew what kind of a scumbag I was, they wouldn't be hanging out with me. And, and I'd have to mani I'd manipulate. I was like the chameleon, like to have friends or associates or, or at business. I would pretend to be what I thought you would expect me to be. I mean, I had all these things going on in my head. I was lying all the time. I, you know, every, everything was a, a story. Now, you live this way. What happens is inside you die a little bit every time. And when I came to my sponsor with this, with this inventory, um, and I started reading it, I went into that fifth step feeling like a scumbag deep inside. Now, not... Not a not a run of the mill scumbag. I was like a special scumbag, you know. You know how we are, you know. Uh, I wasn't going to be a run of the mill anything, but uh, but I but I did. I you know I I really I had so much shame and guilt. And as I start reading this, you know, there's really no reaction from him because a lot of times, a lot of times, the stuff that we make up in our head is our head story. And it's re it really doesn't it really doesn't mean a whole lot. It's something that we've constructed in our head. And I made myself out to be this really really bad guy. And when what it was was you know yeah I would do crazy things when I was drinking, but you know that wasn't that didn't come from my spirit. That that came from my illness. And as I'm reading through this uh, this inventory. And I'm not really getting like a reaction like, get the hell out of my house, you know, from you sick bastard, you know, from from my sponsor. He was not saying that. And, you know, at the end, at the end, when I when I was all done, uh, this was one of my experiences and I'll never forget it. My sponsor goes, you know, Chris, this that's not so, that's not so bad. You know, we we can we can we can deal with that. That's, you know. He goes, he goes, I believe that you were, uh, you were an alcoholic before you even started to drink alcohol. I believe you were like one of those campfires with the red burning coals. And as soon as you took a drink, it was like throwing gasoline on that campfire. And the flames, you know, flew up and burnt you and everybody close to you. And, and right now you're in the process of trying to recover from that. You're trying to make your life a little bit better. You're trying to learn how to have better relationships and treat people better and be less selfish. And, uh, and you know, I walked out of there probably for the first time feeling like an actual citizen, like an actual human being, you know, and not some kind of low life like, like Gollum in, you know, uh, the, in the Lord of the Rings. You know, I, I finally started to feel like, you know, like a human being. And it was, uh, it was my spirit beginning to wake up. Uh, I've heard a lot of fist steps. Um, I've given a lot of fist steps. Uh, every single time there's a quantum leap forward in the person's life, if they continue on, uh, I, I, feel like, um, I feel like if you've missed the fourth and the fifth step, you've missed almost everything. Because the difference between sobriety, mere abstinence from alcohol, and recovery is like the difference between night and day. And the only way to know that is in hindsight after you've recovered, unfortunately. 
Because we have no we have no yardstick to measure what recovery is prior to recovering. If you've never done a fourth and a fifth step, you have no experience of what that will do for you. You've only got an idea. And the idea is completely wrong. You need to experience this stuff to understand it. So, so uh, when I'm working with people, when I'm working with people, I make, I make some things very, very clear. Like the book says in working with others, we ask the prospect to read the book. If you're going to work with me in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going to read the book Alcoholics Anonymous because I'm going to ask you, are you willing to go to any lengths? And I want you to know what any lengths looks like. Any lengths could be anything, right? You know, and a lot of times we're just programmed to say yes, yes, you know, and not really mean it. So if you're going to work with me, I want you to know what any lengths looks like. And I will expect, I will expect you to do step work. Now that cuts down on the number of people that tug me on the shoulder and say, can I sponsor you? But that's fine, you know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not you know, I'm not into collecting or, or, you know, working 24 hours a day with this stuff. But, um, but the experience of the fifth step is, is, is really important. There are, there are eight places that I can count in the book Alcoholics Anonymous where it tells you if you hold anything back, or you're not as fearless and thorough as you can possibly be at that time with the fifth step, you will drink. Um, many of us have tried to find easier, softer ways, and uh, and we can't. So this is this is really something you need to do for two reasons. The number one reason is: Do you really want to put alcohol back in your body? Don't you remember what that was like? If you're anything like me, that needs to be avoided as the number one priority in my life. But the other reason is, wouldn't you really want to be absolutely enjoying life? To be able to live it to the fullest, to be able to deal on all levels, to be able to step out and do the things that you know you should be doing, you want to do, but with an, in an unrecovered state, you just want to stay home. You know, you can't deal. It's about quality of life. Now, at the end of the fifth step, there's, there's an instruction. It says, um, um, it says we need to, it's a construction reference. And basically what it says is, are, are, are our stones properly in place? Have we tried to make mortar without sand? You know, have we skimped on any of these processes? Have we held anything back? Uh, There's a place where you need to stop and you need to read this. You know, have you left anything out that needs to be shared? And if you haven't, it says, okay, go home or go somewhere where you can be quiet for an hour. You know, and and you need to go over all this stuff. You go over the first five steps. And ask yourself, is there anything, anything that, uh, that I haven't done? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to build a foundation for the rest of your life, a recovery foundation. Now, steps six and seven, they're some of my favorite steps, and th- they really are a life process. I mean, there's only a paragraph each. There's a paragraph on step six in the big book, and there's a paragraph on step seven. And it basically says, you know, are you ready to let God uh, uh, take all of these defects of character? I mean, you've inventoried them. You've discovered the faults, the defects, the shortcomings, your sins. They use a lot of different terminology in the book. You've discovered what those are. are. Are you willing to have them removed? And on one level, on one level, we'll all say, absolutely, yes. I mean, this is, where, this is where I'm shooting myself in the foot all the time. This is what's screwing up my life. This is why I can't get ahead. Of course, I'll, I'll have these defects of character removed at, at a level. You know, so I see this as a life process. I'll give you a for instance. Well, how about lust? Will you be completely willing to have God remove lust from you? Well, hold on a minute there, you know. But let me think about this, you know. If God takes my lust, I'll never get laid again, you know. I mean, let's just hold on. 
So, so there, so there's levels, there's levels that, uh, that we're ready to take this stuff on. And it's part of a life process. Um, it says if you're not willing to have some of these things removed, pray for the willingness. So as long as you're praying for the willingness, you know, you're, you're good with step six. Now, the exact wording, we heard it read here. I love the exact wording for the origi- from the original manuscript. You have to understand the original manuscript was what the alcoholics came up with. Then they took that manuscript and they passed it around to people of science, religion, uh, the medical uh, people, uh, uh, you know, editors. And a bunch of suggestions were made from that original manuscript that ended up in the first edition of the big book. But if you look at the original manuscript, that's the way Bill and the boys finished it off. You know, that's how I feel at least. And step seven says, you know, humbly on our knees, holding nothing back. You know, we ask God to remove these uh, these defects of character. Now, when some of the people saw the way Bill wrote that, Bill said, they said to him, you know, you can't have those people. Up. They're never going to get down on their knees, Bill. You got to lighten this up. You know, so he lightened it up. But the first, the early AAs, especially over at Dr. Bob's house, you sure do know they were down on their knees asking God to have these defects of character removed. Uh, Or they'd be in big trouble with the doc. Remember, he was a proctologist. You You did not want him on your ass. You know what I mean? So anyway... um, Humbly, you know, let's let's look at let's look at this. Let's look at uh, humility for a minute. Humility. There's some great um, definitions of humility. There's a wonderful one in the step book. My, my my personal favorite is an accurate self appraisal. I mean, if you really know where you fit into the universe, and you're not exaggerating or you're not making yourself lower than you really are. Then I think I think that's uh, that's a, a form of uh, a form of humility. Um, remember that it says God in these two steps. Now, one of the things that the, the twelve-step abstinence movement gets so much crap for in different countries is our reliance on God. It, it's obviously a God help program. It's not really a self help program. I mean, just read read the instructions. And, you know, the thing, the thing that I would say to anybody who wants to criticize um, uh, uh, trying to access the power of God to solve your problems is, well, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, uh, there's so many so so many treatment processes that, that, that are almost negligible results because there's nothing that's going to create the atmosphere conducive to long-term recovery. This 12-step process does. And when it's engaged in, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Now, my first run through the steps after I did that bastardized fourth and fifth step uh, my first time at about six months, I was now on steps six and seven, right? Well, I went about the task of removing my own character defects. Because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. Okay, I'd heard everybody talk about, I'm working on my character defect. I'd heard that at, you know, 50 meetings. So I started working on my character defects. And and I learned something, I learned something very, (laughs) very interesting, is I'm not real good at working on my character defects. I don't get very far, all right? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll say, okay, this week I'm not going to be selfish anymore. You know, and the first thing I'll do is like, is, is like push somebody out of the way in the express lane or something. I mean, you know, uh, that's just the way I am. Now, uh, if you're going to work on your character defects, the best way I've heard it described is like this. Anybody in here familiar with that game Whack-A-Mole? You take a mallet and a mole puts his head up and you, you try to smack the mole and then another one pops up. If you're working on your character defects, you're, you're whacking the mole. And a very, very somebody very, very close to me one time said, "Chris, you keep whacking the mole like that, and you can go blind." <laughs> I know, I know that's bad. Well, maybe one eye. 
Uh, anyway, uh, it really is. It's an exercise in futility uh, to, 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 to try to do that. The, the word God is in those two steps for a very, very significant reason. My alcoholism was too much for me. My alcoholism too too much for me. I here's here's a here's a typical day for me when I was drinking. I would come to in the morning wearing the clothes that I passed out in the night before, and you know I, 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 the alarm would be going off. It'd be like seven thirty. I have to be at eight, there at eight o'clock, and I I get up and I I'd stagger into the bathroom and I would do my vomiting calisthenics. You, you remember those like. You know, I'd brush my teeth, you know, try to get a comb through my hair and, you know, make it out to the car. And, you know, off to work, I, you know, I go. I'm just ringing, you know, with, with – it's not even a hangover. It's poisoned, you know. And I, you know, I get to work and, I, and my boss would go, all right, I want you to do this, 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 and this. I'd go, all right. I'd get in the van. I'd make it, I'd make it halfway out the driveway and I'd go, well, what the hell did he want me to do? You know, I mean, I was shattered. I, you know, so I'd have to go back. You know, what did you want me to do? Uh, God damn it, I told you to write things down. You know, so, so I'd get out to the job site. And and I am not kidding you. I would swear to God that this is the last time I'm going to do this. I mean, I am ill. You know what it felt like after a really bad night? You just wanted to die. So here I am. I'm at work, you know, and I'm going, oh, today, tonight's the night. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to drink. Tonight's this, I'm going to give this up. This is alcohol. This is bad stuff. You know, and I'll tell you what, if there's a polygraph expert would put a polygraph on me and say, kid, are you ever going to drink again? No, it would say yeah, he's never drinking again. This guy would go put money on this guy. He's telling the truth. He's never going to drink again. About lunchtime, I'm rehydrated. You know, you have to drink about a half a gallon of something. And I got I got some food in me, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm, my my head is starting to, and I'm starting to feel a little human. And I go and I would say to myself, you know, that decision this morning to give up drinking today, that's a pretty that's a pretty stiff decision. That might have to be modified a little bit. I might have to modify that today. And I would stop at the liquor store on the way home. I was caught in this unbelievable cycle I could not break. It didn't matter if I wanted to not drink. That's not going to keep you from drinking. It doesn't matter what the consequences are going to be if you drink, if you go to jail or die. I mean, I've seen, I've seen alcoholics with two esophageal varices, right, go leave the hospital and start drinking. Now, you, you almost guaranteed you're not going to last 12 hours doing that, and I've seen them do it. So it doesn't matter if it's going to kill you. It doesn't matter if you're going to go back to prison. It doesn't matter how much you want to not drink. Until a, a certain psychic change happens, you're powerless over alcohol. I see the same thing in character defects. I was always so judgmental. I could take your inventory from a mile away and not, not even see my part in it. You know, I mean, I was trained and take it and take it. You know, he, he's, he's a hypocritical, miserable bastard. You know, I mean, I just know it. And I was an unbelievable judgmental and I gossip. You know, I get this guy over here and talk about that guy. And then I go over and talk to that guy about this guy. I mean, it was like I was caught in this dysfunctional type of horrible type of uh, relationship uh, type stuff. And I just couldn't seem to help it. And I knew it was hurting me. I knew it was pissing people off. I knew it was wrecking relationships. And I, I tried to stop and I tried to stop. And I couldn't, I couldn't get any momentum. I couldn't get any traction with these things. Now, you know, when you make the decision in the third step, you make a decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God as you understand Him. That means that, uh, that there's got to be some effort on your part. There has to be some action that follows that decision. And part of the action in, uh, in steps six and seven is basically this. If you want to be in the best possible climate for the removal of your character defects, you definitely have to be involved with steps six and seven, coming to terms with them, becoming willing to have them removed, and humbly asking for them to be removed. 
but the best possible spiritual atmosphere to be in for the removal of character defects is steps eight and step nine, where you become willing to make direct amends for where those defects have caused harm in your life and actually go out and make direct amends. The word actually is a really good word to put in front of every action step. Because there are, I heard it described as this. You know what alcoholic insanity is? Being in, being in AA, which is a 12-step fellowship and not doing the 12 steps. You know? Oh, you're in a 12-step fellowship? What are those steps like? Well, I don't know. I don't do them. You know, it would be, it would be like, it would be like joining Oprah's book club and going to all the discussions on the books and never reading them. You know what I mean? But I've got an opinion on it, you know? I'll tell you what I think of that book. Well, did you read it? No. <laughs> or it would be like if you wanted the calculus experience, all right? You want, calculus can help you solve some of your problems. So you, so you go to... So you go to the university and you sit in calculus classes. You don't get a book. You don't do any of the problems. You just sit in calculus like two or three times a week and you share about calculus. You know, and you, you, you're, you talk about calculus. You, you get a calculus tutor, but you, but you don't toot. And, and, you know, you're, you're, you're grateful to be in the calculus class, but, but you never learn any of the exercises. You never solve any of the problems. You can never apply calculus to your life to make your life better. It's the same thing that happens in AA every day. And it truly is alcoholic, uh, alcoholic insanity. Now, um, there's a great story that describes sex and, uh, uh, step six and seven very, very well. Little Joey, okay, he's about five or six years old. It's, it's afternoon, he's just gotten home from school, and he starts to get a toothache, okay? His tooth starts to hurt. Now he thinks, you know, if I tell my mommy that my tooth is hurting, I'll get an aspirin, you know, and the pain will go away. But he doesn't go to his mother and tell her that he's got a toothache. You, you, toothache. You want to know why? Because he knows, yeah, he'll get that aspirin and the toothache will go away. But the next day, there's going to be an appointment with Dr. Mengele, the dentist. And there's going to be drills and smoke and needles and blood. And when he walks out of there the next day, he's going to have perfect teeth. He doesn't want perfect teeth. He just wants the pain to go away. And so often that's us. We don't want to be perfect. We don't want all our defects of character removed. We just want the pain to go away. But the only help out there is perfect help. That's the problem. The only help out there is perfect help. It's a spiritual awakening. That's perfect help. That's what's out there for us. Um, that's all I have on steps uh, 5, 6, and 7. Uh, thank you for... Thank you for letting me share. Uh, we open for sharing, uh, you know, wh whatever, whatever comes to mind. Anybody want to contribute? In the, in the, uh, the beginning of the step book, um, it, it states that the step book was written, written to broaden and deepen the concepts as they were laid out in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. The book Alcoholics Anonymous is the basic text. Um, the step book wasn't written to redo the instructions of the steps. The steps were already fine in the big book. Um, Bill, for a number of different reasons, wrote the, those essays on the steps. And the step book, anybody that's read it, it's a wonderful book. Nobody can pin the alcoholic to the wall like Bill Wilson in those steps. I mean, I, I hear me coming out of that every step of the way. But um, although there's instructions in it, it's not the instructions for the steps. You know, there's philosophy in it, but it's not really a philosophical text. It's more just essays that, that, uh, that Bill and some, some other people collaborated on uh, talking about, you know, the experience of the steps. 
So, uh, so when it's time to actually do steps, it's just more clear in the book Alcoholics Anonymous than it is in, uh, in the step book. Although the step book is a wonderful guide to, for everyone that wants to live a 12-step spiritual life, it's not, in, not really instructional. We're, we're at the hour. Uh, we have a nice way of closing. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.